right. This is Keenan Polemics. We are continuing our mini series as we respond to the Heidelcast mini series Contra Post Millennialism. Uh, we are doing you a favor and interacting with the content on Heidelcast. I'm on our content instead of having you look by yourself. So I'll be interacting with what is said on the Heidelcast and responding instead of assuming that you may be able to go and do so. Our passage today comes from page 674. It is a constant New Testament expectation that to the extent which the gospel of the cross is spread abroad, to that extent, the hostility of the world will be manifested as well. Christ. Okay, so we're now in uh, Bob Nick quotes, and he says, to the extent that the gospel expands, uh, there is, uh, well, so when the gospel expands and increases, there, there is rejection. And the reference is loosely or directly to, to 1 Corinthians 1. And I just want to note that 1 Corinthians 1 doesn't speak about the gospel being folly numerically or in a percentage sense. Um, 1 Corinthians 1.18 speaks about the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Okay, so the gospel being offensive to those who reject it is not making a case for the gospel being rejected and causing persecution being the inevitable majority norm. All Paul is saying in Corinthians is the message of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, to those who reject it, right, for, for various reasons, but not that folly and rejection is the incremental necessary percentage normality. It's just saying that it's 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 folly to those who are perishing. So one of the things that I, I'm trying to bring up here is is how um, Scott and his authors they 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 twist text slightly to say more than what's being said, overstate the, the case. Is destined to be a rising for many, but also to be a falling for many, and to bring out into the open the hostile thoughts of many. So now, now he's uh, loosely quoting Luke two, where there is discussion about like when when this when, when the Messiah comes to Israel, the the hearts of many will be exposed, and it will divide families. Again, there's that, that's very specifically speaking about what what is going to happen. Um, in amongst Israel when their Messiah is revealed. The division of homes and also, you know, the exposure of the apostasy of Israel. Um, but I wouldn't say that that's, that's making a case um, for why people <laughs> are, are going to always be chaotically unhinging in a great greater sense as time goes on. Also, you notice something that when when Scott is referencing 1 Corinthians 1, Paul is also quoting the prophets. Paul is quoting the prophets and the folly of truth um, as Paul's making arguments, right? So yes, Paul quotes the prophets about the you know the wise rejecting uh the truth. He's quoting Isaiah, but guess what? We can't cite Paul citing the prophets to make a case for the controversy of truth to those who reject it and also not allow the rest of the prophets that Paul cites to also speak as well. So you know how Habakkuk 2 says the righteous shall live by faith and that that's the text that Paul uses to make an exposition of, of the gospel in Romans. Well, guess what? Habakkuk 2, 14, further down the same chapter says the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So this gospel that is folly to those who reject it, 
This gospel that is cited by Paul made a case for the citation of Habakkuk 2 later in the same chapter says this gospel that is followed those who are perishing um, will fill the globe as waters with the knowledge of the Lord. He has come into the world for judgment, Croesus, so that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may become blind. Matthew 21, 44, Luke 2, 34. Again, that's also referring to apostate Israel. That's John 9. Those who, are, those who see will be blinded, and those who don't see will see. That also has a connection to, to Romans 11. The, the, a, a partial hardening has come on Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. One thing you'll notice about uh, email guys like, like, like Scott and, other, and others, uh, they, they attribute uh, the apostasy and hardness of heart um, of Israel in the first century, and, and then they portray it on the entire intertestamental period. That's uh, a way they make a case for uh, their pessimism. John 3, 19 through 21, 8, 39, and Romans 9, 32 through 33, 1 Corinthians 1, 23, 2 Corinthians 2, 16, Hebrews 4, 12, 1 Peter 2, 7 through 8. In the last days, the days that precede the return of Christ, the wickedness of human beings will rise to a fearful level. The days of Noah will return. Lust, sensual pleasures, lawlessness, greed, unbelief, pride, mockery, and slander will erupt. So let me get this straight. In the last days after Christ comes, takes his place in the throne over every principality and power in this age and the one to come. In the age where now the, the where before Christ's ascension, all the nations were left to their wickedness and blindness with no gospel, no regeneration. Okay. So after Christ ascends and now Satan is bound so he cannot deceive the nations and the, <laughs> the kingdom is inaugurated and exported, now wickedness will rise to a fearful level. So things were better when there was no gospel all over the globe. And now that the gospel is permeating the nations um, and the light is shining amongst the nations, wickedness will swell in a, in a, in a increasing sense. Uh, <laughs> so in the days of ignorance, uh, depravity was somewhat tame in the world, but in the days when the knowledge of the Lord will cover sea to sea, uh, wickedness will get worse. How about um, the prophets? It says, but there will be no gloom. This is Isaiah 9. And by the way, this is what uh, is quoted in Jesus' ministry. There will be no gloom for her who was in anguish in the former time he brought into contempt in the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made it glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee, the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them the light has shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy of the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor you have broke on the day of Midian for the for every boot of the trampling warrior in battle, tumult, and every garment rolled in blood. We burn as fuel of the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. So Matthew talks about the darkness. Now the gloom that precedes it, seeing a great light, an increase of joy, a multiplication of the nation, 
it, it, an increase of his government, justice and righteousness. And, and you believe that now things will be more wicked than before. Yeah, I, um, I'm, I'm at a loss for words. Let's, let's, let's keep listening. In fearful ways, Matthew 24, 37 and following, Luke 17, 26 and following, 2 Timothy 3, 1 and following, 2 Peter 3, 3 and Jude 18. How many times is Scott with these quotes going to cite 2 Timothy 3, 1 about the evil in the last days? And how many times am I going to tell you that if you keep reading the whole verse, it says, these men will not get very far. Their error will be seen and exposed for what it is. One of the things I've noticed about these mini episodes is that they repeat the same eight verses about suffering in the New Testament and recycle them over and over again um, without even actually explaining the whole verse um, fully. Among believers as well, there will be extensive apostasy. Temptations will be so powerful that, if it were possible, even the elect would be caused to fall. The love of many will grow cold, and vigilance will diminish to the extent that the wise will fall asleep with the foolish virgins. Apostasy will be so general that Jesus can ask whether, at his coming, the Son of Man will still find faith on the earth. So this is something that uh, Scott and his authors continue to do, is, is they, Matthew 24 is the new normal for the intertestamental period. Matthew 24 is a snapshot that is multiplied exceedingly so. Matthew 24 is cited over and over again. Um, but um, I'll, we'll talk about this a few more times because it comes up a few more times. Um, all these things in Matthew 24 are saying that these are things that will happen to this generation. Many, 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 many exegetes believe uh, that most, most of Matthew 24 is contextually speaking about the first century judgment on apostate Israel. That that's not some anomaly interpretation. That is a legit interpretation. And Scott Clark and, and his authors, they, they bank on they bank on Matthew 24 being the new normal when that's a very debatable point. Um, the generation, if, if that's the, if that's if this is speaking about the time up until the end, right? Then pretty much most of Matthew 24 has nothing to do with the actual original audience. Um, so, you know, you can, you can, you can quote all of the things about coldness and, and false prophets, uh, all that you want about Matthew 24, but that was very much a first century, legit exegetical contextual, um, understanding the text, um, your new normal as a dogma, um, for eschatology is, is, is debatable. It, it is debatable, um, at best. Matthew 24, 24, verse 44 and following, 25, 1 and following, Luke 18, 8, and 1 Timothy 4, 1. Thanks for listening. Tune in tomorrow. Yeah, a few more, a few, a few more things. Uh, so he mentions the foolish versions, right? The and There's going to be uh, five foolish versions and five wise versions when Christ comes back. And that's a case for why um, the gospel will not expand and take over the globe. That reference makes absolute no sense because what that's saying is that when Christ comes back, there's going to be so many Christians left that their own, the, the difference will be apostates in the visible church and the elect. They're all virgins. When Christ comes back, the world's going to be full of virgins and God's going to come in judgment upon the apostate fake foolish virgins. But that's not like there's two virgins and eight, <laughs> eight totally not br brides at all. Um, when the Son of Man will find faith on the earth when he returns in judgment, we already addressed that before. We were talking about when God, when, when, when that, that, the context of that is the judgment that is coming on Israel. 
and this the, the woman is praying for justice. And the question is, when you're praying for justice, and when God comes in judgment on Israel, are you going to have faith when God comes and your people, your friends, your family, two million people in a matter of months are being slaughtered? Let me just close by saying this in light of like the the doom and gloom increasing when Christ comes. Look at Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them from the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. The covenant that, I, that the, the covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the new house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, know the Lord. For they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. So in the new covenant, when Christ comes, the knowledge of God amongst the people of God will increase and abound. As opposed to when Christ comes and he extends his kingdom to the nations, apostasy will increase and abound and be the inevitable, necessary normality and ever increasing, inflaming, exploding, crescendoing norm. So we'll end there and move. Uh, I'm not going to. There's a there's a few episodes I'm going to skip because some of them are about theonomy and I'm not I'm not a theonomist, so I'm not even going to mess with those. And a few of them are about historical things and postmillennialism history. Like I'm not going to do I'm, I'm going to stick to the episodes contra postmillennialism that are dealing with the text. Um, so if you wonder why I didn't follow every single one, that's why.